Thank you very much. I hardly recognize myself with these <laughs> introductions. Um, the reason I'm doing this talk, because climate is not my day job. My day job is asteroids and meteorites and, and comets. But what I did as an undergraduate, because I, I, I went through and had a normal college career, and then in my 30s, I had an early midlife crisis and went totally bonkers and decided to go back to school and become a scientist. And so I start, had to start all over again because I, I went into the graduate advisor at the University of Washington and said, I want to go to graduate school in, in geology. And he said, well, have you ever taken a geology course? I <laughs> said, so, well, no, you don't need one for economics, silly guy. <laughs> but I know this is what I want to do. And that's another story as to how I arrived at that. Um, but I went back in, the, in, in, my, in my early 30s. And as an undergraduate, I needed to eat. And so I got a job in the stable isotope lab at the University of Washington. And this was a, this, you know, I've been a scientist for a long time since, and I have never been in like such an elaborate central casting science lab as I walked into that day when I applied for a job. Because it was a room about twice the size of this room. And it was covered floor to ceiling on all the walls and down the center with glass tubing and beakers and Bunsen burners and stuff bubbling over. And, 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 and big machines with lots of flashing lights. It was, it was a science lab from Central Casting. <laughs> and what they did was, amongst other things, they, they measured the isotopic ratios of ice cores, and that's what I did for three years. And for, two, for, for three hours a day, three days a week, I would stand in a freezer and cut up ice cores and then go measure them in a mass spectrometer. You know, and, and here I was, I, you know, middle-aged undergraduate, no experience in science. And I said, I want a job running a mass spectrometer. <laughs> and for some reason, they let me do it. And so a lot of the data I'm going to show you today, I actually took. Which is kind of cool, because I was at, I, I attend scientific meetings later, and, and years later I was sitting in a meeting, and some of the data I took flashed up on the screen. And, some, and in the question and answer period, somebody got up and said, I don't believe that data. It looked like they made a bunch of mistakes. And so I got up right behind them, and I said, I took that data. <laughs> And we notice the trends that you notice, because we're not idiots. But we checked it over three times, and that's reality. Just because you can't figure out reality, that's not reality's problem. That's your problem. <laughs> and I'll be happy to discuss this with you outside. I'm kind of, I believe in kind of a muscular science. <laughs> I've always wanted to do that. And I, <laughs> Anyway, so I'm going to show you a bunch of stuff. The problem is, with climate, there's a lot of things going on. This is not soundbite science. So I'm going to t tell you a lot of complicated stuff. Um, I'll try to be entertaining. Some of it will be boring. I apologize in advance. <laughs> but with climate, you hear a lot, of, a lot of stuff. You see greenhouse gases are warming the globe. Sunspots actually cause the warming. These are actually the sunspots from Tuesday. I doubt you could, there's, a, there's a, 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 a NOAA site that you can go to and get the latest sunspot data. That's the latest sunspot data. That we're in ice age. That the glaciers are melting. Sea level is rising. CO2 is natural. CO2 was a lot higher in the past. CO2 was a lot lower in the past. That the Earth is a lot warmer in the past. The Earth was a lot colder in the past. <laughs> and the problem is that everything here is true. Sound confusing? Well, no, it's not. Actually, it's quite reasonable. The thing is, we actually know quite a bit about past climates. This is what I did in this laboratory. Now, I can go into excruciating, mind-numbing detail as to how we know it and the physics behind it. I will spare you that. If you insist, I will tell you. <laughs> OK. But the, what this does is it tells us, for the, we, know, we know the Earth's climate history pretty damn well for the last half a billion years. For very, you know, after that, it gets a little tricky. But for the last half billion years, and that's not bad. 
And so we can actually look at what's normal for Earth. And the question is, what is normal for Earth? Is today's climate normal for Earth? Now actually, this, I like this picture because this is, this is the same location. Um, there's about 60 years difference here. You can see the bathtub ring uh, left by the glacier right there. <laughs> see, right there. So, also, what I'm talking about is climate. And climate is easy. I read climate out of the geologic record. Predicting weather is actually tough. That's way beyond my abilities, because that is hard. You know, there's a reason why people don't forecast hurricane tracks more than five days in advance, because that's really, really hard. I don't do weather. I do climate. And when I talk about climate, I talk about long-term climate. Climate in geologic terms. And in geologic terms, you can actually find out the effects, because this, this climate experiment has been done over and over again in Earth history. And all you have to do is go back and read the rocks. And that's what I do. Addressing the question, what is normal, all you need to do is go back and look at the geologic record. And how things change with changes in the various climate parameters, all you have to do is go back and you can read the past climates from the rocks and the chemistry are laid down in those periods. And the nice thing is that people that are a lot smarter than I have have puzzled this out. And a lot, uh, you know, a lot have a lot higher tolerance for boredom. And so they've done this <laughs> over the last half billion years. And we know this pretty well. About as well, you know, remember science is tentative. Science, we're always groping for answers and testing these answers. So, you know, we know, that, so the, 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 there are various grades of how well you know things. This is a pretty high grade. We know this pretty well. And so what's normal for climate? This is Phanerozoic. Phanerozoic is what you live in today. That's the period when you have like complex critters. We are here at zero in the Neogene. We'll go back a, a half billion years. And the first thing you see is that it is about as cold right now as it has ever been in the last half billion years. We are actually in an extraordinarily cold period. We are in an ice age today. We're in a war relatively warm period of an extremely cold period. <laughs> you know, I didn't say this was going to be easy. This is, this is, you know, reality is just, I'm not gonna sugarcoat reality, this is reality. And so we are very cold. Back during the Cretaceous, the K means Cretaceous, scientists don't spell well. Um, <laughs> It was extremely hot, but, that, but, nor, but average for Earth is a lot hotter than it is today. But what you should take, from, take away from this slide is that there's nothing normal about climate. Climate varies a lot. And it varies a lot for very good reasons, which we can figure out, and which we will figure out tonight. But what were things like in the Cretaceous? Cretaceous with a C. Back in the mid-Cretaceous, this is the temperature profile by latitude. We are at, we are about right there, um, about 30 degrees. So actually the climate for the latitude of Pensacola was not all that much different in the Cretaceous than it is right now. It's pretty warm, um, not unbearably warm, because you know, with a little bit of air conditioning, it's very pleasant to live in, uh, in Pensacola. Um, but it's much different than the present day. And the difference is not in the low latitudes, it's in the high latitudes. Because in the Cretaceous, nowhere on Earth, even at the poles, was it on average below freezing, if you can imagine that. In the Cretaceous, you had a temperature profile that essentially made middle, uh, uh, what you consider temperate climates going all the way to the Arctic Circle. So in the Cretaceous, you had warm adapted vegetation and warm adapted critters at the Arctic Circle. You can, find, you can go to the Arctic Circle today in Canada and find um, breadfruit tree fossils, fossils of turtles and crocodiles, 
And there was no continental glaciation anywhere, not even the poles, not in Antarctica. You had tropical conditions to 40 degrees north-south latitude. So that's the same latitude as New York. Can you imagine the climate of Key West in New York City? Coral reefs growing off of Long Island. No hard freezes in Ohio. Can you imagine Ohio without, without hard freezes? People would want to live there <laughs> all year round. I can, I, I can say this about Ohio, because I've lived there. Um, I, yeah, I don't want to insult Ohio. Ohio is a wonderful place to live. But they have hard winters. This is, you would have essentially the, the, the climate that you enjoy in Pensacola in Ohio. Why so much warmer? Well, back then, CO2 was at about 1,700 parts per million. Now, this doesn't mean a thing to you right now. You will know these, these numbers at the end of this lecture in great detail, because I will keep repeating them to you. <laughs> That's six times the pre-industrial levels of CO2 that we enjoy, we enjoy in the, the, the recent period. And remember, when I talk about recent, I'm talking as a geologist. So this is over geologic time. I consider the recent period the last 10,000 years. This is just my quirk. So when I talk about the old days, you know, the old days are, you know, 70 million years ago. Uh, you know, the other, the other uh, quirk is that I just don't, I don't, I'm not interested in things, scientifically, I just don't, don't have interest in things that haven't been dead for half a billion years or so. <laughs> but no, that's another story. Anyway, so why so much lever? Much higher CO2, a much different ocean circulation in continental locations, but there was a downside to all of this. So basically, this would be, in the Cretaceous versus now, this would be the same location. This kind of vegetation, which today, it looks like that. The downside, of course, is that no continental glaciation means a much higher sea level, something like 150 to 200 meters higher sea level. <coughs> so the downside is that St. Louis is a seaport. <laughs> there is no Florida above, above the, the waves. All of Florida is a shallow, part of a shallow sea. Um, almost all the coastal areas are inundated. Uh, you know, all, the Middle East is mostly underwater. Um, you know, so there are good parts and bad parts, like anything else. <laughs> so it's much warmer. You can live in Ohio quite pleasantly, except you just don't get to live in Florida. Now you ask, well, that, is that normal? Well, what is normal sea level? We are here at zero. If any of you work in the oil industry, you might recognize what is called a veil curve. This came out of the oil industry after, after spending literally billions of dollars of research because this is how you find oil. The way you get oil is, is what geologists call a succession of transgressions and regressions of sea level, which trap the right sort of critters and right sort of sediment underneath the right sort of layers of stuff in order to make oil. And that's very much a function of sea level. So this is actually pretty damn good data. And because, you know, it, you make billions and billions of dollars if it's exact. So that's a good reason. It's not just because, hey, you get tenure or something. You make vast <laughs> amounts of money. And they fire you if you screw up. Um, yeah, so, and also, you see the spikiness here? That's actually real. Sea level is actually highly variable and not just from melting glaciers. It turns out that the mid-ocean ridges where most of the volcanism occurs, this plate tectonic stuff, the plates actually move around, they actually vary quite a bit. And when the, when the mid-ocean ridges decide to crank up and, 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 and create plate faster, they actually expand. If they expand, there's no other place for the water to go except into your homes and gardens. So, and this occurs on, you know, this is geologic time again, so it occurs on like million year time scale. So, you know, don't go out and sell your waterfront property. Um, but, you know, this is, you have to recognize that this is the sort of thing that happens. So let's talk about the recent climate. You know, and the recent climate is like the last 50 million years or so. Um, back in the Eocene, it was pretty warm. And then what's been happening over the last 50 million years is a slow deterioration, and, but steady deterioration of the climate. You actually, 
you actually didn't get Antarctic glaci glaciation until about 35 million years ago. And then it, it glaciated and thawed out and reglaciated. And since it's been reglaciated over the last about 12 million years, there's this been this very steady, very sharp drop in the average temperature of the globe. Why is this happening? Well, before I go into that, I just want to say that the, uh, this, the, the, this, if you just look at the last five million years, this trend has continued and it's been very steady. And what happens is that it's climaxed in a series of glaciations. In the last million years, these glaciations have greatly intensified. And so you're getting bigger swings in climate as, as it gets colder. And so what we're, we're, we're living in is a relatively warm period of what is an incredibly cold period in Earth history. So this is the last 400,000 years, and I actually took some of this data. We are here, and what you find is for the last 400,000 years, there have only been four periods when it was this warm. And these periods usually last three or 4,000 years. Does that make you worried? I, it made me worried <laughs> when, I, when I took this data. It's OK, though. I'll show you why. But anyway, we are here. And we're actually in the most extraordinary uh, long interglacial. This is, these are, the, the warm periods are called interglacials. And these things are typical. The glacial periods are, 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 are characterized by the stepwise deterioration in climate down to a glacial maximum. Now, what are glacial maximums like? The last glacial maximum was 18,000 years ago. Um, last glacial maximum, you had a mile-thick glacier, mile-thick ice in New York City, Berlin, and London. <coughs> you had a mile of ice over Seattle. You had continuous sea ice down to Cape Hatteras in the winter. Can you imagine your condo in Cape Hatteras in the winter with continuous sea ice? Continuous sea ice down, down to Baja, California. Well, I've been to Baja, California. I've gone in the ocean there. It's cold. I can see why it would have sea ice there, but still, that is kind of extreme. But we have excellent geologic evidence that that's what happened. And you had continuous summer sea ice all the way along the continents. How do we know this? Well, once again, you can go look at the, the geologic, you can read this out of the geologic record. You can look for um, what are called geologic striations. And don't believe me. Go and look for yourself. This particular location is the, the bedrock in Central Park. And you can see grooves cut in it from the rocks dragged on the bottom of the glacier. You can figure out how thick and what direction the glacier was moving from the depth of the grooves. This particular one is across the street from the American Museum of Natural History. As you go through the Iron Gate, turn to the right. Go and look for yourself. Same thing with the, um, with the crocodile, turtle, and breadfruit fossils in the Canadian Arctic. You can go to these fossil locations and you can look for yourself. I urge you to do that. Watch out for the polar bears. <laughs> so what caused the Ice Age? Well, blame China and India. Seriously. What's happened is, is that we actually live in an extraordinary, I keep saying this, we live in an extraordinary time in Earth history, but we do. Very few times in Earth history are you able to walk to the bottom of the stratosphere on a mountain. But you can do that in the Himalayas. That is a very rare event. You think because you can do it today that it must be normal for Earth. But no, that's very abnormal. You look back in the geologic record and you don't get 30,000 foot tall mountains very often. This is really unusual. And what happened is over the last 20 or 30 million years, India collided with China and created the, the Tibetan Plateau, an extraordinarily high set of mountains. That really, when you, when you raise stuff up like that and you break up rock like that, what you do is you vastly increase rock weathering. Now, I can go into excruciating detail again on the, on the chemistry of rock weathering, but the bottom line is that it sucks carbon out of the atmosphere like crazy. 
And that's what happened here. We've lost about 80% of the carbon that was in the Cretaceous atmosphere due to the Himalayan rock weathering. So you can blame China and India. <laughs> and what happened was, this has basically made the climate vulnerable to small changes in solar energy inputs. Now, and these small changes are caused by orbital variations. The orbital variations are always there. But since you don't have as much greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, it makes it more difficult to distribute heat across the planet. And if you don't have the greenhouse gases, you're not going to distribute the, the heat into the polar regions. And if you drop the solar input to the polar regions, you're going to end up getting glaciers. And so what happens is that the glaciers are triggered by variations in the Earth's orbit. The way this works is, you know, blame Kepler and Galileo and Copernicus. The Earth is, Earth's orbit is not a perfect circle. You actually are closer to the sun by about 5 million kilometers in the middle of winter, January 3rd. Did anybody celebrate perihelion? No. But we will next year. Now, next year you can celebrate perihelion. And it's really easy to remember. Aphelion is July 4th. Everybody celebrates aphelion. <laughs> Nobody celebrates perihelion. I could never understand that. Um, but you get 6% less solar energy at aphelion. And aphelion happens to be in the summer. So the, this actually moves around in the orbit and, and in the seasons. It's called precession. And so right now, summers are a little bit cooler and, warmer, and winters are a little bit warmer because of the positions in orbits. But that changes over time. And it can be a fair amount. 6% of solar energy is a fair amount. This is basically a simple idea. If you have warm winters, you're going to melt all the snow that falls in your really cold. Or if you have warm summers, you, you, you melt all the snow that falls in your really cold winters. If you have cold summers, that can allow snow to accumulate in, in the right latitude range. And also, warmer winters tend to produce more snow. And I think we're starting to experience, last year was a, was a good example of that in the Northeast, where it was relatively warm, but it was really, really snowy. The guy who puzzled this all out was a Serbian mathematics professor called uh, Milenkovic. And I'm, I actually have, a, there's a Serbian graduate student in our group, and she just despairs of my pronunciation. So I apologize in advance that I mispronounced his name. But this was ba back, in the, back in the early day, days of the, the, 19, the 20th century. This was big science, the, uh, the question of why there were ice ages. Because you could see abundant geologic evidence that there were at least four big ice ages, four big glaciations in Europe and in North America. And, and, and the, the, question, the burning question was, why? And this guy decided that, that um, the way to figure this out was to look at variations in the solar flux at high latitudes. And you can vary that solar flux at, at, at 65 degrees north latitude by as much as 25%. But the way to prove this was that you had to do a bunch of spherical trig and figure this out over the last quarter million years. Now, a smart student with an Excel spreadsheet can do this in about two weeks. Back then, in the old days, astronomical computer was not a machine. It was a job description. If you wanted to figure out where to point your telescope, you needed somebody to, 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 to puzzle this out. And so astronomical computers were the people that actually figured, that told the fat bearded white guy who was the astronomer, <laughs> I can say this being a fat bearded white guy myself, and also astronomer, um, where to do this. And typically the staffs were lots of really smart women who graduated from Ivy League colleges and you know, uh, prestigious women's colleges like Holyoke and Bryn Mawr who couldn't get jobs anyplace else. And these guys actually did a lot of the fundamental astronomy in the 19th and 20th century and didn't get any credit for it. Because, of course, this guy wouldn't put any of these names on his papers. Um, a major injustice. Being a fat-bearded white astronomer, I apologize for that. 
but that's the way it was. You know, the, the, way, the way you figure this out was somebody actually sat down and did the math by hand with a pencil. And that's what Milankovitch did. In 1910, he started working on this. And he figured that if he, his day job was teaching mathematics at the University of Belgrade. And he figured that if he, when he came home and had dinner and then worked for four hours a day, five days a week, and took all Saturday and worked 10 hours a day, and then Sunday he would go to church and hang out with his family. If he did that, he could, he could do all the necessary calculations in only 22 years. You know, this was science back in the old days, you know, no Excel spreadsheets. Um, he, well, he was lucky and unlucky at the same time, because what happened was that World War I hit in 1914. He was, he, he was a reserve officer in the Serbian army. He went into the army. In 1915, he was captured by the Austrians, thrown into prison camp. And he had a buddy. In the, in, in the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, who bailed him out of prison camp. And this is a different age. I was an Air Force officer, so I think this is really cool. Back in those days, if you were an officer, you could give your word, your parole, and they would let you out of prison camp. And you would promise not to, you know, raise your hand and promise not to fight anymore. And then they would let you out of prison camp, and you could go off and do your own thing. What a civilized concept. <laughs> And so what they did was they paroled him to the reading room of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences in Budapest for the rest of World War I. And so he was able to work on his stuff 10 hours a day, seven days a week. And he actually got years and years of, of, of work done during that period. And he went back and he actually was able to publish in 1925. And what he found was that if you look at these cycles, that, there's, that the orbit of the Earth's orbit actually affects the amount of sunlight you get tremendously because there's an eccentricity cycle <coughs> that goes from about zero um, to point uh, to, to six degrees in the, um, in the roundness of the orbit. There's a tilt cycle that goes from about 24 to, to, to 21 and a half degrees and a, a and an index of precision that, that where, you, where you are in the orbit when you're closest and farthest from the sun. And you can combine all these effects and actually see how much sunlight you get at high latitudes. And it turns out that that just lines up with the relative cold and hot in the climate. This is more of the data that I took. And so there's the 100,000 year, this is hot, this is cold, this is right now, this is uh, roughly 100,000 years ago. Um, that's, the last, that's the previous interglacial. This is the eccentricity cycle, 100,000 years. There's the precession cycle, 23,000 years. That's the tilt cycle, 41,000 years. It lines up. These orbital changes absolutely dominated our climate for the last half million years. And, this, and all the other things that you, see, that you hear about in climate, El Ninos, uh, Pacific Oscillations, uh, Atlantic Decadal Oscillations, all these are in the noise. All of that is subsumed in the thickness of the lines you see here because this absolutely dominates. This is what creates a mile thick glacier on top of New York City. And just because it's a little rainier because of El Nino, that's in the noise compared to having a mile thick glacier on top of your apartment. <laughs> OK? So that's where we are. So our climate for the last million years has been characterized by these long periods of terrible glacial conditions. Glacial conditions like you know, tundra in southern France. Um, you, can go to, you can go to southern France. I did this last year. And go into the, and see cave paintings where they have cave paintings of herds of reindeer, because that was the scene. You know, now you, you know, it's bikini-clad uh, women on the beach, not reindeer anymore. <laughs> All that is driven by orbital changes. So the nice thing is, though, that you can calculate how these orbits are going to affect climates. Because this is what absolutely has dominated our climate for the last half million years. And we should be able to figure out what the climate should be doing, given the solar input. 
And 10,000 years ago, it was really warm. This is the line you need to look at here because this is summer insulation. Uh, the, the amount of sunlight you're getting at 65 degrees north. And it peaked about 10,000 years ago and then has been in decline ever since. So what should be happening is we should be dropping into the next ice age. Climate should be deteriorating. Things should be getting colder, given the solar input. The problem is that it hasn't been. Solar input is dropping, but the ice is melting. So what's going on? And what's going on is, is us and greenhouse gases, CO2 and methane. What happened is that our ancestors were smart kids. Uh, about, up until about 8,000 years ago, um, the atmosphere stuck with historic trends. But about 8,000 years ago, our ancestors invented agriculture, started clearing forests. When you clear a forest, what you do is you it's slash and burn. You put lots of carbon back in the atmosphere. You control the forests with fire. Very intensive, uh, very carbon intensive sorts of agriculture. Methane the same way. About 5,000 years ago, they invented rice cultivation and domesticated livestock. Nothing is, is a better uh, methane producer than a herd of beef cattle. Um, you, can, you can also test this for yourself. Go to a cattle ranch. Let me know what you think. Uh, the other thing is rice cultivation. I don't know how many of you spend time in rice paddies, but rice, rice is, a, is a swamp grass. And so what you need are swamps in order to grow rice. When you don't have swamps, you go create them. And, if you, it, and one of the tests here is that you can sort of cruise around um, the Far East on Google Earth just to see how extensive the rice cultivation is. Prove for yourself. This, these, these terraces are 3,000 years old in the Philippines. Basically, once you use up the swampy terrain, you got to start terracing or you starve. And terracing dates back about 5,000 years. The limiting factor here is water. If you have a source of water, you can make terraces. I really like this picture because essentially it looks like a topo map, but it's not. It's just, um, this was a book I found in the library. It was done by Claire Chenault's um, uh, photo reconnaissance officer during the World War II period, worked for the Flying Tigers. And so he has all these great pictures of China the way it used to be. Um, you know, these days they, you know, they run superhighways through this. But uh, essentially, everything that, had a so everything that could be terraced was terraced. And so human input to the atmosphere started a long time ago. It's not just us in the industrial age. Basically, in the pre-industrial age, you started out with about 260 parts per million CO2. And human activity stopped the decline of CO2 and, and, and methane in the atmosphere and cranked it up to about 280 parts per million, essentially putting carbon, gigatons, billions of tons, a gigaton is a billion tons, of carbon into the atmosphere. So about 80 gigatons of carbon. That's equivalent to about 10% of the biomass. But that's about right for the forest clearing that happened in the pre-industrial age. The problem is that you, your, your, your solar input is still dropping. And so even though you're tossing in more carbon from burning more forests and, 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 and domesticating more livestock and, and, and making more rice paddies, there's a, there's a point of diminishing returns. And so actually things started to get colder back in the Middle Ages, simply because you couldn't keep up. What we did then was we tapped a new reservoir. We figured out how to get into fossil fuels and use those. The whole pre-industrial atmosphere had about 600 gigatons of carbon in it. What we do now is we add about nine gigatons a year from fossil, from almost all from fossil fuels. There's a tiny little bit. This is, a, this is cement production right here. All the rest of this is, is uh, fossil fuels. 
Um, people say, well, you know, what about volcanoes? The entire, on average, the entire volcanic input into the atmosphere is two tenths of a gigaton of carbon per year. People say, well, what about Mount Pinatubo? Mount, this is Mount Pinatubo. Notice the guy with the water buffalo plowing who's ignoring the largest eruption in the last 150 years. Um, that's Clark Field in the background. Since this is, this, since this is a, uh, a flyer town, probably a few of you flown into Clark Field. Uh, Clark Field was a little bit the worse for wear after this. Um, but anyway, the Mount Pinatubo eruption, they're not really sure, but this is in the noise. 0.08 gigatons of carbon as a maximum estimate. That's in the noise. The, the biggest natural input, net input to the, the atmosphere is volcanism. And that's 45 times lower than the human input from fossil fuels every year. 45 times. So, now remember, I've been talking thousands of years and hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and these are big trends. So let's talk about the noise, because you and I live in the noise. I've been talking about geologic scales. You and I live at human scales. And so year-to-year -year variation, or decadal variation, means a lot. Within the, vi within the big trends, there are a lot of short-term effects. Things like sunspots, Pacific decadal oscillation, southern oscillation, volcanic eruptions, all sorts of other things, too. And all of these have an effect on short-term climate, because this spikiness is real. That's the, no that's the noise that I said was, that was the noise I was talking about in these big swings. But remember, when we're talking about big swings, this is, this is the swing down into the ice age. It goes about another, another uh, 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 six degrees down here. So that's what, I was t that's what I'm talking about with the, the big glacial swings. So we live up here in, these spiky, in the spiky area. Let's pretend, and I don't like to do climate modeling because that's really complicated. I like this model because it's fairly simple. And I'll just show you this to show that it's possible to explain short-term variation. Let's, let's, let's pretend that short-term climate is driven by four things. The sunspot cycle, because sunspots do affect solar irradiance and the amount of watts per square meter that the sun dumps on the Earth. So you get an 11-year cycle where you get a little more irradiance and a little less. And the, it affects it on the, on the order of, uh, of less than a tenth of a degree C, like half a tenth of a degree C. Then you get volcanic aerosols. Mount Pinatubo blew up and threw a lot of gunk into the upper atmosphere. And that actually cooled things down quite a bit. That's Mount Pinatubo right there. And um, then you get the European, you get the um, El Nino Southern Oscillation. El Nino actually does change the energy balance because it's a big lump of warm water that sloshes around the Pacific uh, in the simplest sense. And once again, we can do this more complicated. But if you sum all of these things and say that's what drives the short-term climate with this anthropogenic influence, that is, dumping more carbon in the atmosphere. You can actually model, the black line is the instrumental surface temperature record, or as I like to call it, reality. You can actually model reality pretty damn well. Not bad, though. Fit is 87. The thing is, though, that we're just coming out of a very low sunspot cycle. Actually, historic, uh, in the last 50 or 60 years, a historically low sunspot cycle. So things were actually slightly cooler because of low sunspots. But we're going into solar maximum right now. So sunspot cycle is cranking up. As a result, what's going to happen, I will predict, is for the next four or five years, you're going to have a succession of extremely hot years. Sad but true. And so far, it's, it's, it's proven, uh, uh, the average temperature records have been proven that that's, that's what's happening. So, of course, people can say, well, is the temperature record wrong? Well, it could be. Uh, but it turns out that you can, 
you don't have to rely on instrumental records. You can do things like you can measure temperatures directly from boreholes, because um, there's actually a temperature record that's preserved in the, in the, the, the shallow crust. Uh, all of these show strong warming in the last 100 years. Uh, you can look at the average monthly sea ice extent. Um, this is updated to this year. And it's declining. You can look at Alaska growing seasons. They're getting progressively longer. You can look at uh, um, low elevation glaciers in, in Alaska. The one I showed you um, was Muir Glacier. That's not the only one, McCarthy Glacier. I love these guys because what they did was that they went through and got a whole bunch of old National Geographic style pictures of glaciers in lowland Alaska and then went to the exact same place and took another picture. I love this. And I've got a big collection. of them. I'll bore you with a few of them because I just love these things. Northwest Glacier. Northwest Glacier really got hammered. There it is, way back up there. Point is that you can look at a glacial mass balance and it's just dropping off a cliff. Um, trends. I was born in 1950. When I first drew breath, the CO2 level was 310 parts per million. In this room today, it is about 390 parts per million. Back in 1950, we were putting out 1.3 gigatons per year. Today, we're putting out about 9 gigatons a year. You know, you just have to be in Los Angeles and look out at a, at a crowded freeway and say, how can you believe that doesn't have an effect? Of course it has an effect. The other effect is, when I went to graduate school, I was in my mid-30s. And so when I walked into Brown University, I was the oldest graduate student at Brown University. I ended up sitting next to a guy who was the second oldest graduate student at Brown University. I was 35, he was 34. A guy named Wei Deng from People's Republic of China. I said, Wei, you know, 34, that's pretty damn old for a Chinese graduate student. And he said, well, yeah, I went to graduate school back in the, the regular time, but then the Cultural Revolution hit, and they sent me into exile in Tibet for nine years. So, wow, that's a really good excuse. <laughs> then he looked at me and said, what's your excuse? <laughs> you know, it's like the 70s. I lived them, I don't remember them. Um, but that was 1985. And the Chinese, which, which, you know, this is like a quarter to a third of the world's population, they did us this huge favor during most of my lifetime. You know, this is a, a hugely populous, hugely talented, uh, hugely smart, ambitious group of people who decided to make themselves just dirt grinding poor for decade after decade after decade. And they didn't compete with us for resources or anything. They just wanted to be poor because, you know, that was their, that was their policy. And so they're, they're, this is the GDP of the, the People's Republic. And then about, unfortunately, um, Mao Zedong died. Mao Zedong was this huge favor for us, believe me, in terms of carbon dioxide. They decided, oh, well, why should we be poor anymore? Let's go make stuff and sell it and become rich. And boom. This one only goes to 2004. The, the actual GDP is uh, uh, 40, 47,160 billion yuan. You know, it's like above the second floor now on this plot. And all these guys want the sort of same sort of thing we want. You know, they want to live a middle class lifestyle. They want to drive a car. They want to have freeways. And they want to have power that works 24 hours a day so they can run their air conditioning. Because believe me, it's just as miserable in Shanghai as it is in Pensacola during the summer. Because you guys are at the same latitude. <laughs> and so they're going to want to, they're going to want to, they're, they're producing a, a, a gigawatt sized coal fired power plant every two weeks in China. So what do you think that's going to do to the carbon input? OK, so some answers. Yes, we're in an ice age. If you look back over the last half billion years, continental glaciation is very unusual. Very unusual. Does the climate vary? Of course it varies. It varies constantly. 
Is the current climate normal? No, normal for Miami is to be under 80 meters of water. <laughs> normal is not to have a Florida. Is the planet warming because of human action? I, as a scientist, I am just floored that this is, this is, this is a, a political thing for political discussion. Of course it's warming. We are well into the next uh, Milankovitch cycle. We should be getting advances in glaciation. And we're not, because we've been smart enough to, this is called geoengineering, we've been smart enough to change the atmospheric chemistry and redistribute the heat into the high northern latitudes and make up for this solar insulation that we were not getting. Human action over my lifetime has increased atmospheric CO2 by 25% and stopped the Milankovitch cycle in its tracks. But we have to recognize what we're doing. The downside of this is that if you look in Earth history and you have high levels of CO2, high levels of greenhouse gases, you don't have continental glaciation. If you don't have continental glaciation, you don't have Miami. So the bottom line here is, do you like sea level where it is? Yes or no? <laughs> if you don't care, then we're done talking. You know, go and drive your Hummer. Now, um, as I tell my class, this is not my problem. I'm going to be dead before this is, this is going to be a serious problem. This is, this is my children's problem and their children's problem. You can, really, you can expect um, sea level rise of between uh, about two and a half to six and a half feet over the next, by, by 2000, over the next 90 years. Most of that is going to, it's going to be nonlinear, so most of it's going to occur toward the end of the century. The unknown here is the dynamics of, 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 of uh, glacial collapse. Now, luckily, uh, in Greenland, Greenland is kind of bowl-shaped, so most of the glaciers are surrounded by, by mountains, and there are only a few exits. And so it, won't, it probably won't collapse really catastrophically. You can see things in the geologic past where, um, where you have catastrophic glacial collapse. Um, the Laurentide Ice Sheet in Canada catastrophically collapsed and melted. If any of you have ever been to Quebec or Montreal, you can see the St. Lawrence Valley. And if you look at the St. Lawrence Valley, the St. Lawrence occupies this little tiny strip on this big, huge, flat plain of a valley, and you can see mountains off in the distance one way and mountains off in the distance the other. That whole thing used to be a solid river when the Laurentide Ice Sheet collapsed. And what happened was over a thousand years, you increased sea level by 30 meters. So you can get really rapid sea level increase. Um, so do you like sea level? Because what's happened is that we've already gotten to a level where the Greenland ice sheet is in disequilibrium with the CO2 level in the atmosphere. It's going to melt. The question is how fast. And the, we're working on that. We don't know quite yet. But this is going to be a problem for future generations. My students then say, oh, thanks a lot. You know, I say, well, hey, you know. I'm just passing it along. You know, my father left me the Cold War. His father left him World War II. You know, that's what generations do. They didn't appreciate that, but what the hell. <laughs> so anyway, just to give you a little bit of perspective, um, we are here. So, you know, one meter is no big deal. Two meters, um, not so good for the keys. <laughs> you know, but then again, you know, this is, you can see why the Florida Chamber of Commerce hates this. <laughs> you know, ask yourself what percentage of the assessed valuation of Florida is within 10 feet of sea level. So anyway, I will leave you with this happy thought. Thank you very much. <laughs> <clears throat>
you know, the reality is, 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 is a lot of fun sometimes. And the canaries have been dying in the mines, uh, and I'm thinking of the southern hemisphere uh, especially, the droughts, the dying of cattle, yeah. the, the dying of people. Are they not feeling it before we are? Well, the, the problem is I look at this as a geologist. And so the, the, I hate to, be, to sound um, unsympathetic, but the average age of a species is about 3 million years in geologic times. So you get extinctions all the time. And you can, you can argue till you're blue in the face if this extinction or that drought is caused by global warming. Because that's a modeling problem and it, it doesn't have a definite answer. If you look in the geologic record, what you can read out is that sea level is correlated with CO2. And so this is what I can definitely point to as solid evidence. Yeah, I agree with you that, it's, it, that droughts, um, changing climate conditions, um, more rapid uh, extinctions are all part of, the, are all part of the, uh, the equation. But you can't really point, it's sort of like smoking and, 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 and lung cancer. You can't say, well, you know, that's the smoking gun right there. This is the smoking gun that I know about. And also, I'm a rock guy, so this is what I know about. <laughs> more questions? Over here. Thank you very much for an engaging lecture. Pensacola sure. was blessed uh, about a month ago with a speaker named John L. Casey, who's written a book called Cold Sun. And his premise is that there's a 206 year cycle, and like you mentioned, there's a, there, we're in the, the, the phrasing end of it. And he says there's actually some kind of a sun hibernation going forward. Do you know anything about any a sun well, hibernation? Well, yeah, the, there's a. You get, you get a variation in the sunspot cycle. And there was a period called the Maunder Minimum where basically you had no sunspots. And so that makes things a bit colder. That doesn't make things anywhere near cold enough to, do the, to affect these glacial cycles. Um, as, as I said, that sort of thing is in the noise. Um, whether the, there's actually this 200 odd year solar cycle is pretty speculative stuff. And I've seen evidence for, and I've seen pretty strong evidence against. So um, it, it might be, but it's in the noise. Yes, sir. Let me uh, ask you to combine two areas of your expertise. OK. I have been reading that the uh, polar glaciers on Mars are actually shrinking. And I don't know if that's true or not. But can you use Mars as a model, you know, absent all the anthropogenic effects and just look at some of the, the major effects, the uh, solar irradiance and the global mechanics and so forth? And I don't know what you'd have to do, maybe have boreholes on Mars or something to. <laughs> but well, that, you know, that's not beyond. Well, actually, there's a quick answer for that. Mars is actually more variable in its insulation properties than the Earth is. And so people have done this work. And Mars varies so much that, that you, you actually can change the tilt to about 45 or 50 degrees. And when that happens, the polar caps melt, put, all the, put lots of carbon in the atmosphere, and you increase atmospheric pressure by a factor of five. So people have thought that during those periods, you might have enough atmospheric pressure to have like you know, bacteria and critters and things. And that's one thing that NASA is looking for. So yeah. We've applied this to Mars, and that it does work. And Mars is actually kind of in the depths of its ice age right now. Yeah. Well, wow, wait for the wait for the microphone. Loved your speech. Thank you. Thank you. Got a lot out of it. But I need to think this through. Um, we can say this, but there is no proof that that's going to happen. We, we, can, we can go through the math, we can do all the scientific evidence we can, but show me the numbers. You show numbers, and, yeah. and I appreciate that. I can make pretty graphs. I don't think that's going to happen. Okay. It's, that's fine with me. See, um, I don't do any mathematical modeling. What I do is I look at past epochs in Earth history where you've had elevated CO2. When you have elevated CO2, you have higher, higher uh, uh, sea levels. 
and um, you can uh, you can you can do the Milankovitch modeling fairly easily, and there's a number of sites that do that for you. So you know, take a look at it yourself. As I say, in these in these uh, past uh, climate epochs, don't believe me. Go and you can go and look at these things yourself. Um, you know, one of the things about scientists is we don't believe in theories; we observe them, and so we're always constantly testing them. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you.